Alright, so, uh, we'll do a little our standard thing. Are there any writing-oriented things that you guys are curious about, uh, that we haven't discussed in the class, things you've run into in your own personal writing that you're worried about, or stuff like that? Yeah? I was just curious if you, if you were done, you finished your magic system, your, your laws of right uh -huh. magic system. Did you finish that last time, or do you need to? Yeah, I think that's one. You got to, like... One. No, you started no, no. on rule three. You started mentioning the third one. Oh, yeah, the third law, which I said we will talk about, um, which we very well will probably still talk about. Um, Sanderson's third law. Sanderson's humbly named third law. Um, <laughs> we, we will get to that. Um, we're going to probably do a business um, class today, and then we'll get back to more world building next week and filling in. What's that? Yeah, bring it up next week. Do it next week. Okay. Yes. You said to mention next time there was a business lecture to explain contracts and how to get a good agent. Okay. So we'll go ahead and make a list of what we're going to talk about today because I was going to talk about also self-publishing. And then we'll talk contracts and getting a good agent. Was there anything else I put on that list um, for next time? All right. Any other questions then? Yes. It doesn't have to do with that. That's fine. That's what we'll, we'll do other questions first and we'll dig into that. Okay. Um, so my story is an urban setting. Okay. Um, and it's not quite fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to figure out how to, like the technology I'm writing about is not quite real and it's not even possible in the real world. Okay. So how do you make it sound realistic? Uh, you, you do the same sorts of things that we talked about last week. Um, we, um, but we, you, you go beyond that. You're, you're trying to make it feel like it could happen, but it really can't. Um, a master of this was Michael Crichton. If you read any of his books, most of his science is really, 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 really theoretical, to the point of being magic. But he talks about it in such a brilliantly technical way that you can't find that dividing line of where he stopped talking about stuff that was actually scientifically plausible and moving into stuff that was completely scientifically unrealistic. He did this in Timeline, he did this in Jurassic Park. Um, he, of course, did it in Sphere, but Sphere is, is, is completely out there. But the, he was really good at this, so that might be something to look at. Um, go read like the opening chapters of Timeline. Um, and he talks about time travel and, um, and teleportation and things like that. And he starts with really good science and then moves into all of the, the, the um, theoretical sorts of things. Um, the, the way to really do it though is be consistent and be rational. Um, be logical. I mean, people buy all the time completely fabricated science. For instance, the, um, you know, enhance that, right? Enhancement. You, you guys know it's from CIA, C CSI, or whatever. They're like, hey, that photo has a license plate. Enhance. Um, which, <laughs> it, you know, the pixels aren't there. The information isn't there. They're making up information, they're using magic. Um, to enhance those pixels, but we all accept that as realistic. Um, and um, in the Mission Impossible movies, they do like the realistic masks that they rip off, um, which is completely fabricated. There's, you know, we have nowhere near the technology to achieve some of these things, and yet they make them seem very realistic. Um, and so, being consistent and being plausible is really all you need to do. Uh, do a little bit of research in the area so that you can talk about it intelligently. And then give it to some of your friends. Have read it and, have at, and ask them afterward how realistic did this seem. Um, but really, being consistent is your, is your best friend with this. Um, and also remember, you don't have to turn your, your, your urban fantasy science fiction thing into hard science fiction. Um, as long as your book isn't about the science, you honestly, most readers will buy, you say, this is how it works. Your main character doesn't understand how it works because your main character does not have a PhD in you know, quantum physics. <laughs> but this is how it works. And as long as you're consistent, readers, readers will buy it. Other questions? Um, I did want to talk about a few little things I wanted to mention to you about dialogue before we get into some of this other stuff. I don't think I've done this um, yet, so let's just give you, I want to give you some clues on writing your manuscript in a way that will immediately make it look professional, okay? Uh, the first one is that 
tell me if I've talked about this, because I'm pretty sure I have it. If you're doing your, um, your block of text, your dialog, this is not usually as, um, as, uh, as preferable as as this, okay? Now, I don't know if you, can, um, if you can make that out with all the squiggles in it, but this one is, I went to the store and bought some food, it was good food, um, and then on the way home I got in a car wreck, I'm sorry, honey, Karen said, okay? As opposed to, I went to the store, Karen said, and I bought some, um, some of this and some of that, but on the way home I'm, I got in a car wreck, I'm sorry, honey. Meaning, putting your attribution at the end is worse than putting it near the beginning. The reason for the, yes? Uh, actually, just a question, is yes. that, uh, do you want to do that just about every time? You or? want to do that every time. Every time it's humanly possible to put this early, do it. The reason being that your reader will be scanning this whole paragraph waiting to find out who said it. And until they have the context of who said it, they're going to gloss over naturally a lot of this information and then find out who said it and then go back and reinterpret it and essentially you're making them read the same sentence twice. Either that or they're going to um, keep on going and miss the context, okay? So, the first reasonable place, the first reasonable break, um, sometimes you can go a full sentence because it'll be a short sentence, it's not compound, but the first place you can, even in, in, you know, if there's an address, hey Derek, Put, put it right after that. Um, get it as soon as you can. And in fact, if you're going to have this big block and there's not a good place for it, put a beat right in front. Front. Travis. Um, in a situation where it doesn't require, hopefully, an attribution, Yes. could we just leave it out entirely? I mean, even yeah. if it is somewhat long, then just leave yeah. it out entirely? Yeah, you, yeah. as long as... Um, the, the, the main place you're going to not need an attribution is um, if you've got a dialogue between two people and you've already established who's talking. Um, this works particularly well if you're good at dialogue. And that means pe what people say are distinctive is distinctive. Um, and people can keep it straight. You can actually have a much better sequence without using the tags um, if, if you know what you're doing. But if there are three people in conversation, you basically have to use the tags always, unless one is a direct answer to the other. You know, if I said, we were, we were all having a conversation and Travis asked me a question, I said, well, Travis, um, that, that is going to follow well enough that you probably don't need the attribution there. Um, and leaving it out, you know, attributions are invisible. Keep this in mind. The brain interprets the, the said and the asked really quickly. And then, um, and then gives context, which means that you can err on the side of putting in more attributions if you want to. So would you recommend just saying things like said, as so next not, point, not we'll get to it, we'll get to it. I want to get this down first, and then we'll get to that. Um, so, this is what we call a beat. A beat is showing what someone does alongside their dialogue, okay? And so, if you have the, the paragraph start with Karen Grimace, you don't actually then need any attribution, okay? In fact, you usually want to leave one out because you've already, you already have one. On line with this, anytime someone does something that's short enough, you know, a, a sentence or two, and then they speak, put them all on the same paragraph. It'll follow directly for the reader's mind if someone does something and then talks. Um, splitting it into paragraphs is usually, not always, but usually a bad idea. Um, Karen walked over to the, uh, to the chair, and if you put on the next paragraph, her talking, the reader is immediately going to assume that went to another person, because they're going to interpret her walking to the chair as a beat. And then the next line of dialogue they're going to interpret as, her, as hers, unless it's on the next line, where assume, they're going to assume it went to somebody else. Okay? So mastering this, which is really easy to master, helps the flow of your dialogue a whole lot. Okay? Keep things on the same paragraph when you can. Use the attributions as early as possible. Alternate between, um, between uh, beats, um, the attributions. A couple of points. Number one, don't use too many beats. Um,
I'm guilty of this sometimes myself. The thing is, if you modify every sentence in a dialogue, it gets really annoying to the reader and it slows it down. If every sentence somebody's doing something, so you're giving a, 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 an expression every sentence. If you're telling, you know, what's going on so that frequently, your reader has trouble focusing on the dialogue, and, and that's the point of the sequence. Now, that's not to say you shouldn't have people doing things during dialogue. You should. Um, but I would say try and keep your, your descriptions of what's going on. Have a little flurry of conversation, a back and forth, three or four um, back and forths. And then get into what someone's doing. Do another little flurry with maybe one or two beats in there, advancing what's going on, and then give a little bit more description. Hey, I think there's uh, actually a seat right over there. There's two of them. Um, so just decide what your personal flow is going to be. There is no absolute right way or wrong way to do this, but be aware that you don't need as many beats. The thing about a person's mind when they start jumping into dialogue is they switch to dialogue mode. And in dialogue mode, they just start looking at this stuff. In fact, they start ignoring the beats except to see who's doing, um, who, who's involved, and who's saying what, and they'll, they'll pick up some cursory, cursory information from the beat, but unless you transition them out with a few paragraphs of description, they're going to stay in dialogue mode, and a lot of readers are going to skip all the other stuff you put alongside your dialogue. So keep it short and quick alongside the dialogue, and you will find your dialogue sequences work a lot better. Okay? Yes? Did you say that like, as a class you tend to lean more one way? I see um, a little too much of this. Um, I've mentioned to some of you that your dialogue's really good. Often I'm meaning you're doing all of this stuff well. Um, either that or I'm meaning, I usually try to tell you. Uh, otherwise I'm meaning your voice is good for your characters and it feels natural. Um, but, um, but I would say I'm seeing a bit of this. This is normal um, for newer writers. I did a lot more than I used to. Um, I, I used to do a lot more than I do now. I still think I do it a little too much. Um, if you look for really great dialogue writers, like Terry Pratchett, he's a genius at dialogue, you will find that his beats are really, really used very, very sparsely um, in order to keep that flow of the dialogue moving really well. He's great at it. Um, there are others. Do you guys want to throw out any others, people that you think they're really good at dialogue? <coughs> Nothing comes to mind. All right. Um, Wasn't Scott Kyer? I think he's pretty good. Scott's pretty good. Yeah, he is. Um, and you'll see he uses he uses even less. He, he goes way far in the um, the not using beats for here in his later books. If you go look at like the uh, the Ender Shadow books, boy, it's, he'll have pages of just the dialogue um, with some with some attributions and things. But he'll make sure everyone's talking in a distinctive <coughs> way. And you know you can go pages and not even have to notice what the um, what the what the different attributions are. He goes a little bit far for me. Um, I read epic fantasy. I do prefer to have a little bit more thickness to some of my books, but it's an interesting exercise to read some of those. He does a, a fantastic job with it. So, um, the other item to mention with this is the thing we call said bookisms. I don't know where this term came from, but it's the um, my it's my editor's term for it. So I just started using it. I don't even know how universal it is. Um, but the said bookisms are all the things you use instead of said. Um, and newer writers, one dividing line between newer writers and more experienced writers, is newer writers tend to use a ton of said bookisms, and more experienced writers tend to move away from it naturally, is what we've found. Um, the reason for this being, most writers uh, uh, don't, it's either other writers give it to them as advice, but I think it's also something natural you start to realize is that all of this stuff is invisible, and you want it to be invisible most of the time. Um, and so anything you use something here instead of said, it draws the reader's attention and focus away from the dialogue and to the non-dialogue stuff, and actually shifts them out of the dialogue reading mindset in the middle of the dialogue, which is a bad thing. Um, now once in a while, you do want something here that shifts them out and, um, and adds extra punctuation to the sentence. Um, screamed is going to be different than said. Now, a lot of hardcore anti-said bookism um, authors will say, just put an exclamation point and italics, and the context should say that they're screaming, and you should never have to write that they screamed. I don't go that far. 
Um, I do try to keep myself to using these infrequently, um, meaning once every five or six times. I don't count them, but that's what I really strive for. If I look through and notice I'm using them too often, um, then, then that can be a problem. One of the other things to realize here is that some other things, other than said, are going to be invisible to you that are not invisible to other people. They become invisible to you because you use them so frequently that they just feel like said to you, commented. Um, it's like this. Some people use it so often that it just becomes said to them. And so they're, they're like, Brandon, it's, why do you mean it's drawing people out? But the thing is, for a lot of people, that's not invisible. It's different enough than said that they're stopping just that for a fraction and reading that word when you don't actually want them reading that word. Because a lot of time when we're reading, we're not actually reading. We're not looking at the words. We're interpreting with our brains. And this is the mode that you actually want people to get into. They're paying attention to what's going on. They're getting sucked into the story. You don't actually want them stopping and reading your said bookism most of the time. Um, but mentioning ask is invisible for most people. Ask is usually going to be invisible. And um, most of the time, even the hardcore anti-said bookism will say you can use these two pretty interchangeably as long when you're asking a question. I heard somebody say uh, after somebody has ask on there, then mm -hmm. they um, have on the next one they would put reply rather than putting said. I hate reply mm -hmm. because you're already doing it. That's the thing. As soon as it happens, you're giving the reply after the reply has happened. Um, that's a personal thing of mine. I don't think you almost ever need it. Um, I used to use it a lot, though. Um, but it comes down to this, why use it on it? Why show something and then tell it to us? And a lot of these are tells. A lot of them are. Um, even screamed is a tell. Um, I use screamed, I use whispered, I use a fair number of these. J.K. Rowling uses them all over the place, and she's a fantastic writer. So this isn't a hard, fast rule. You're going to have to decide for yourself. But if you're using them, use them because you intentionally say, I subscribe to the theory that this is good for my writing. Knowing that about 90% of professional writers disagree vehemently with this, okay? Um, and most editors do as well. If you use a lot of these in your first page, the editor's going to look at you as an amateur. Um, if you are hardcore on the I like these, I would still suggest in your opening um, paragraphs, use only said and asked if you're, set, if you're saying to an editor. Maybe, you know, some things like screamed or, you know, some of these yelled or shouted or stuff like that. Um, once in a while, but try to get away from using any of them. It'll make you look more professional. And after the fact, you can go to them and say, hey, I like these more. Can we have a conversation about it? And see where your editor stands on it and that sort of thing. Okay? This is, um, this is a hard one for a lot of writers to get into because in, um, in grade school and secondary school, we're taught to be creative. You know, use your thesaurus, um, and we're, we're taught to explore, and so we start using a different word every time, thinking we're really creative. Um, not realizing that in actual storytelling, the way that storytelling works, these, that these things are hurting you. Um, as an aside, using the thesaurus, a lot of editors say throw away your thesaurus. The reason for this being that um, using a big or unusual word from a thesaurus should not be done for its own purpose. It should be done because the word fits better. And if you don't know the word well enough to know that it fits better, then you shouldn't be looking up one. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, I, I would say I often use a thesaurus to look for that word that I know is there that I just can't figure out at the moment. But don't feel like you have to expand into lots of flowery words. Um, and poets can teach you this very well. Um, good poetry is not about using flowery words, it's about using the right word. Yes? Isn't it, isn't it good to not repeat word, the same word? It is, it so is. There is that, that, there is that right? one. Yeah. Um, this is getting into some deep level prose stuff, but Mark is right. Um, you should be watching for unusual words, you know, something like, um, you know, acidic. And then, you know, several paragraphs later, acidic. Um, that just draws attention to itself. 
And so you want to get away from, make sure you're not doing that in your revisions. And that might be a reason also to look to the thesaurus um, and things like that. Um, yeah. I had a question on, uh, well, for example, a knife and dagger. Let's say you're having a knife fight or something. Yeah. And I would say go ahead and use knife and da knife as often as you want. What you want to stay away from is using slash over and over. Hmm. That's, that's, you know, the knife is there. They're ready for the knife. But in your descriptions, if they're always just slashing each other, that's where you say, okay, instead of slashing, he's going to jab. And instead of, you want to just construct your, your, um, your sequence there so that particularly the verbs imply them doing different things. Um, using the right verb, by the way, is what a lot of masters of fiction say is uh, the secret to good prose. Getting away from adverbs and adjectives and using the right verbs and nouns. Uh, the reason for this being that the verbs and nouns are the ones, the things doing the work. And the adverbs and the adjectives are actually not doing the work, they're just changing, you know, it's like to, to a lot of people, if you, if you are using an adverb or an adjective, it means you haven't found the right noun or verb. Um, this is why, has anyone heard it before, Be, take it, cut, cut, cut down adverbs and adjectives? Um, it, it's big writing advice. The main reason for it, i found, is, has anyone not heard that before? Okay, a couple of you. Um, it, be, it becomes, a lot of high-level writing advice says, get rid of all adjectives and adverbs. Um, and you'll find a lot of literary writers in particular will talk about this. Um, you know. I think that's going a little far, but the core meaning that, the, of what they're talking about is try and find the right word. Instead of saying he walked quietly, say he snuck, um, and that sort of thing. Instead of the, this is the opposite of the said bookisms. With the said bookisms, you know you're not you're tr distracting from your your dialogue. These things you put in your descriptions and in your action mo uh, moments when you want people focusing on that, and you're going to use the precise word and the precise language because their attention is on it then, and that's the good place for it. Um, granted, if you use something really weird, it's going to pull them out. So be aware of that. But he had a question, then I'll come to you. So like, what if you find the perfect word, but like only 20% of your readership like knows this definition, let's say? That's fine. Just don't use the, do that too often. Uh, Anne McCaffrey did this all the time. And I, I would, as a kid, have a, a dictionary next to me. Um, but she used them in such good context that I knew what the word basically meant before I had to look up the word. And that's great writing. Um, I've had teacher, a teacher, basically tell me to do the same thing. You know, you go through, highlight all your adverbs and yeah. adjectives, but also do it with to be verbs. To be verbs, yes. Um, I should have mentioned those. To be verbs are usually a sign of something you can cut. Um, not always. Here's the thing. You have to realize where a to be verb is in the wrong place. Uh, for instance, see if I can construct something. He was a um, tall man. He was working on his, um, his uh, chopping wood when I found him. Well, you can just say, the tall man slammed his axe down on the wood, shattering it. And taking out the two was instead makes an active sentence out of two sentences that are bland description. Um, and so cutting out the to be verbs, it's a, it's a sign to watch for that can help you become a much better writer is when you can look at those and see them highlighted and say, is there a way I can make this an active sentence with something happening, with descriptive, uh, with, with the right verbs and the right nouns, instead of just viewing it and describing what it is. What if it's like ideas you're trying to communicate? You're, you're not going to be able to get away from using some of them. Uh, particularly to be verbs. Uh, you just are not going to be able to get away from it. But all of these things are rules of thumb to if you want to practice being more active and being more precise, highlighting these and saying, can I cut some of these and exchange them for more active verbs, uh, you will find that it immediately takes your writing and changes it to something more engaging. Um, again, uh, People use a lot of hyperbole here. Cut all of this, cut all of that. No, you don't need to cut all of this, you don't need to cut all of that. In fact, in fact you'll find very good writers, great writers, who are using a lot of these. Uh, the tricks of these sorts of things is learning how to streamline your prose and make it more active, um, more concrete, by using precise language. It's something we can all 
work on more. Um, you'll find mistakes. This, this is the sort of you know, show don't tell sort of stuff, which once again, you can find um, people doing it poorly and even the greatest works you'll read because it is so hard to do all of the time. But practicing and learning, and particularly those early um, pages of yours, you want to send to that editor, you really want to show off, this sort of stuff can really make you show off. If you can make it so that there are very few to be verbs in those early, sent, um, early pages and show that you can really make it work, of course, what you really want to do is do it for your whole book. But certainly for those first chapters, take a look at these things and see where you can cut them. Um, one of the things that we're, we're doing here is we're getting rid of the passive voice. The hammer was slammed against the table. It is passive voice. Because um, what this means is, you probably all know it, just I'll describe it for those who don't. Um, what it means is, something is happening to the hammer. The hammer was slammed against the table. In a sentence where the hammer is actually doing the action. And so changing it to the, you know, um, the hammer slammed against the table, instead of saying it was slammed against the table, it doesn't change the tense. Um, it still happens in the past tense, but what it does is it makes the hammer, which is actually doing something, the focus of the sentence. That's actually different from Billy slammed the hammer against the table. Billy slammed the hammer against the, ta against the table, then is making Billy do the action. And asking yourself with your sentences, who is supposed to be doing the action, what is supposed to be doing the action, and how can I make sure that it is, has a correlation to what's happening, um, is another way to beef up your prose. The passive voice really is something to kill um, all of the time if you can. Uh, this is one that, that is even more absolute than the others. You really can get around to getting rid of that passive voice. Um, and you'll start doing it by second nature as you write better and better. All right? Yes? When going from writing um, adult fiction to young adult fiction, yes. do you consciously change your language, or is it just the content? Right um, I consciously, I don't change the complexity of my sentences, mm -hmm. I change the, um, the complexity of the story to streamline it. Mm -hmm. That is basically what I look to do. Um, when it goes through an edit, my editor, my editors will often say, um, this, is, this is not a middle grade word, let's look for another word. And I let them be the judge on that and help me. Um, I'm revising a, um, a young YA book right now and one of the big pieces of advice I got back from the editor is, um, and this was good advice, that was that, you know, my books are magic system books often. This book is a magic system book. But even though I had taken care for the learning curve, they felt I still overloaded on the magic too early, and they wanted the shift toward character early. Um, because you need in that YA book to latch on the character, and they said, it's, it's, it's good that all that complexity is there. What we want you to do is make it more boneheady in the magic system department in the first three chapters and ease into it so that it's still just as complex by chapter 10. But the first three chapters you're using even vaguer terms and, and things like that for the magic to keep the focus on the character. Uh, which is great advice. Um, really for any book, but specifically for the, um, the children's books. Um, in my adult books, I can trust my readers who know my books to jump into chapter one and say, okay, we're going to get crazy magicism here. I'll just deal with it because this is what Brandon's books are about. The kids, um, it's, it's, that's, a, that's a bad move. You have a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. is. Can you re-explain? I just, I'm a little bit confused. What do they want you to do more in the first three chapters? What do, I'm just saying, uh, well, for children's, um, yeah. they want the focus to be on the character oh, and the voice of the character and away from the world building. Okay. So, like... More character, less world building. That's how they said it to me. What they really meant was, Brandon, these technical terms for all your magic things, those can be moved. All right, any other questions on prose? I am not a master of prose. Um, if you want to learn from a master of prose, um, I guess Leslie Norris is not around anymore. Um, he would have been the first place I sent you, but there are, there are better teachers of it. Lance Larson is very good at prose. Um, in the, um, in the English department. He doesn't much care for fantasy. Um, he told me to, um, that uh, he would like, he, he asked me to read 100, um, was it the 100 Years of Solitude to learn how to write a better fantasy book. And I said, 
I read it and I said, Lance, this is a beautiful book. This is not a fantasy book. Um, <laughs> um, but he does really understand prose. Um, so learning from a poet about choosing the right words is a great place to go. And there are people in the department who are very good at this. It is not my strong suit. I'll be upfront with you on that. These are tricks that I've learned. I try very hard to do or Orwellian prose. We talked about this, didn't we? Um, man, I didn't talk about this either. I swear I talked about this. Stop me if I'm wrong. Some of you are shaking your head. Other ones seem to be not shaking their head. Um, so, there is a famous essay by George or Orwell. You can look it up if you want. If you just or Orwell in window page where he describes what he tries to do is writing a story so that the prose is like a, a, a pane of glass. And that you see right through it to the story happening on the other side. You know, those are people. Yay! Um, so the glass is not there to obscure. And in that, he tries to make every, the words as distracting, as, human, as, as undistracting, as translucent as humanly possible. Um, other types of prose are described, described like stained glass windows, where there's this gorgeous, beautiful prose that you are looking through, and you can still see the story on the other side, but the stained glass window is coloring this story in very interesting ways, and different, changing your interpretation. A lot of literary fiction will try, not all. This is basically the concept of poetry. You look through a gorgeous stained glass window at a concept, which then changes the way you view that concept. Um, and, and some literary fiction tries to do this as well. Um, and so I try for this. Um, it's, it's much more of a craftsman style than an artist style of writing. I prefer it, I, um, but I like reading both of them. Um, they can both be very, very good to read. I pick this one. Um, there are those who, um, who advocate um, a sort of uber prose. Dave talks about this, which is a melding of the two um, that is invisible when you read it and gorgeous when you pay attention to it. Tolkien is usually the one mentioned as, um, as being able to do this um, to an extent. Um, I don't know if I can give you advice on how to do this, because you basically have to master both of them. Um, and they both take a lifetime to master, and then combine them somehow. Um, there are people who are very good at this. Um, I stick to trying this, though I will sometimes do a little um, more flowery start to, a, a, um, to a, a chapter, where my description, I allow a little bit of stained glass into my description to set that particular chapter, and then I go, um, then I go window pane. Um, and you'll see this used very often in genre fiction. You see it used poorly also, where this is where we get into what we call purple prose, where the, it's over-described. It's someone who's not good at description. Because remember, good poetry is not about flowery language, it's about precise language used correctly. Um, and you can use some of these more conceptual, um, uh, flowery is the wrong term, but you know, beauty, awe-inspiring language. Some of you are actually quite good at this. Um, right at the beginning. And then I will transition into window pane. Robert Jordan did this too. Um, like if you're trying to go for like a mood of wonder, like with your magic systems, with your world, etc., do you probably want to go with more beautiful prose? You could certainly add a little bit. I mean, there's, there's, you, you could say that there's like a whole continuum between here. Um, and certainly you could go that direction if you wanted to. Um, it, the worry is that both of them are hard to do, and so mixing them is even harder. But if you're naturally good at it, or if you do this consciously and say, here's what I'm going to try and do, I'm going to go towards more flowery, and I will see this sometimes. Um, they will do things like they will have a flowery narrator, and again, flower is the wrong term. They will have a stained, little bit of stained glass narrator, and then they will try for window pane in all the action, dialogue, um, and storytelling. And so they have this narrator who kind of comes in occasionally. Um, you, guys, um, you guys played like the game Bastion? The game Bastion kind of tries this a little bit and, and does it somewhat successfully. It has a narrator on top of the game who's speaking in these, this very colorful um, sort of dialect-filled um, language. It's, it's not really this, because what that's doing is it's giving it a really strong voice. But I could see you giving a strong voice to a narrator who speaks in this sort of way and then tells a story this sort of way. Um, but I think it's something to be aware of and to experiment with, honestly. Um, if you're naturally good at descriptions that are beautiful, good metaphors, 
um, and your, your sense of, um, of poetic styling, you know, you can use words with the right sounds to them in the right places, it have the right rhythm to them, then you may want to move somewhere along toward, the, um, toward this side. It can work. All right. Let's talk about business. Once again, as I'm, as I'm erasing this stuff, experiment with this. Learn it for yourself. Practice it. Pay attention to it in writers you read and see which ones are writing prose where the prose draws attention to itself versus those who in, in, try to write in a way that the prose does not draw attention to itself and see which styles you like better and which ones work for which stories. Um, there is no right on that continuum. There is just how good you are at what you're trying to do. Self-publishing. I want to talk about this first. Um, because it is a little bit of an elephant in the room with all publication business discussions these days. Um, and that is because if you haven't been following along, which I assume most of you have been, if you haven't been following along, the ebook explosion has happened. Uh, finally, after being predicted for 10 years and never quite making it, it happened. Um, I went from a Hero of Ages, uh, in, a, in a given quarter, sold nine copies. Um, on ebook, one one quarter or one I guess half of a year, so one one royalty statement, so one six month period, to jumping up to selling something like fifteen thousand, in one six month period. Okay, all right. When um, so that's not a very <laughs> long time. Um, Owl of Law sold seventeen thousand um, copies, ten thousand of which were ebook copy, and seven thousand which were hardcover copy in its opening week. Okay, um, so I am now shifted to more ebook than non ebook in my sales, which is really, I tell you, throw a crimp in me trying to track things. So I used to get book scan every week, I still get book scan every week, but now it's basically meaningless because I have no idea on the back end what the ebooks are selling because you only get those every six months because um, book scan doesn't track those yet. So it's really, really confusing to understand what things are selling what. Um, Good Kind sold 17,000 of his last book, um, which is a, in hardcover, which is a really solid number, um, and, and made number one on the New York Times list. I made number seven, selling 7,000 hardcover, 10,000 ebook. They were different months. And so you, it's, it's so hard to tell nowadays what means what as a sale. Do you think part of that might be because you released the first few chapters on ebook? For free earlier. Yeah, Maybe, I don't know. I think the main part of it is that uh, science fiction fantasy people also overlap with tech people who early adopt. And now we're out of the early adopter stage. If you know anything about how things go, we're way out of the early adop adopter stage and we're um, into the, the mass. Um, we're not into the, you know, the next stage, which is ubiquitous um, access, but we are into the all, everyone who's interested in technology, even slightly, has something now that reads ebooks. Uh, and he's probably experimented with them. Um, and so because that group overlaps so strongly science fiction and fantasy, um, we see a lot of, uh, of early adopting. But ebooks are weird in a lot of ways. Number one, in this, this is one of the main, mar um, the only times where older people are part of the early adopter group. Because ebooks can change font size. And so those who had to have large print books can now have an e-reader. So that makes them that makes them actually very weird. Um, you know, a lot of also people who read disposable books rather than just the tech geeks like these people who read um, who read a lot while they're traveling. Uh, I think this turned off. It's not good. As long as it's not bad. The camera's recording? Okay. Um, so, the other thing is that, um, <coughs> that people who read disposable books, so housewives, love e-readers because those, that's one of the largest reading segments of the population, and um, they read the romance novels on the e-books, um, on the e-readers. Uh, you no longer have to worry about the weird cover of your book um, and things like that. And so, anyway, it's changing, it's changing the market a lot. Alongside the concept of e-readers is the concept that, um, do you want to set it down again? Uh, I, will, I will change the battery. Okay. 
um, the concept that you can self-publish much more easily than you used to be able to. To self-publish even 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago, but 10 years ago certainly, required a large input of capital. Um, and you would end up with lots of books in your, in your garage, and it was a difficult thing to do. Um, even when the POD started taking off, right before the ebook um, launch, POD is where you would like go to the website and you could order a copy of the book and they would print it and send it to you. So you could self-publish by having just a website there for your page and everyone who bought it, the, the company just shipped it to them. Even that was a little bit hard because the, um, the POD books had to be costed at a level of um, way, well above what a comparable book by um, a New York publisher could be because of print run sizes. And so instead of paying you know, $12 for, um, um, for a book, uh, a comparable book, you'd have to pay $20. And so that made it really hard for the self-published people. They either had to price their book at such a point that they were making no money, which they normally would, have, they would end up doing, um, or they would have to price it so high that no one's going to buy it except their friends and family. Um, and so this self-publishing was really, really hard until e-books took off. Now, um, there is no capital investment to e-book um, publishing, um, no, no, re no necessary capital investment um, to e-book publishing, and so it's become a lot easier. And so a, a, a big revolution is happening where people, I, I mentioned several websites for you to read, a big revolution is happening where everyone is saying, why not just self-publish yourself? Why not skip the middleman of the publisher why not do this all yourself and put it up on Kindle, iBooks, um, Kobo, and um, Barnes and & Noble, um, and sell it yourself? Um, yeah, but wouldn't it still be worth it to invest some capital and maybe like a good... We're going to talk about that. We will talk about all of this. Okay. Don't worry. Um, but you can do it for nothing. You can do it for nothing um, if you want to. Um, and the royalties paid to you are 70%. Um, as long as your book's priced between $2.99 and $9.99 um, $9 on Amazon, you get, um, you get it there. Um, the, the royalties, I think, on iBooks and um, the others are actually just, it doesn't matter what your price is. You, basically, you get like 60 set, 65 70 it's uh, somewhere in there for everybody. So you're making 70% of the cover price yourself, and there are several large-scale success stories of this happening. The one that people mention a lot is Amanda Hawking. She's kind of old news now. Um, not that, it, you know, I mean, she's still publishing things, but I, I think that there have been several that have come that I haven't noticed since her who have done the same thing. Um, but you can read about Amanda Hawking. Um, the thing that I want to point I want to make to you um, is that despite all of this, I really feel, and this might be a controversial statement, that self-publishing has not changed. Um, it has not changed from 20 years ago. It's become easier, but the fundamentals have not changed. Um, Self-publishing had um, a stigma for a long time. I don't think it ever deserved it. There were always good reasons to self-publish, and there are still good reasons to self-publish. However, the fact that it is easier to do so does not change. Your main hurdle is that you have to do everything yourself. Okay. And this can be an argument for or against self-publishing, okay? If you are really excited about the concept of doing everything yourself, and we'll talk about what everything entails, then this can be a big plus. I know for a lot of people who like doing, um, who, who are indie publishing, and I do like that term, even though some in um, traditional publishing don't. I do think it's a good term. Um, that doing everything yourself, they're excited by that concept, having, um, having control over their cover, having control over um, editorial, having control over their marketing, that makes them excited. Um, number two, um, shelf space, which now gets, quote, um, gets quotes around it, is your biggest problem. And that means that in the sea of new books coming out, you have a very, every writer, new writer has an uphill battle. 
the uphill battle is much greater for the self-published writer and always has been. That's because you don't have the publisher's marketing um, team behind you. You don't have the publisher's seal of stamp of this is a book done by Tor um, that, that there are legitimate number of people that recognize and say, okay, Tor does good books. I will try this book as well. You don't have um, you, you just don't have any of that, and so it's a very uphill battle for you. Um, If you look at almost all self-publishing success stories, they have happened because the person has a good platform. Okay? In self-publishing, this works really well, even in, um, in traditional publishing, but I, you, you see it um, a lot more in this, a platform. Meaning, you have a spin on selling your book, which is going to, make, um, which is going to help you. Um, the poster child for this recently was, uh, was Larry Correa. Uh, we did some Right Excuses episodes with him. You can listen to them. He was self-published um, for a while and did very well at it. Very well meaning uh, this was before the ebook revolution, and he sold like two or 3,000 copies of his book, which is actually a really solid number for a locally, regionally published. He may have gotten even higher than that. You have to ask him. Um, he, he may have gotten as high as like 10 grand um, in sales uh, as a self-published writer. What Larry Correa did was he is a gun nut. He's a, he loves guns, he loves types of guns, um, he belongs to a lot of gun listservs, gun bulletin boards, all of these things, and he sat down and said, there, I want to write urban fantasy novels, you know, like Men in Black, or like Harry Dresden, these sorts of things, except I want them, everyone who's out there killing monsters, to be using awesome guns, written toward all the people who have awesome guns and know all about the awesome guns. And I will spend pages telling you about the awesome guns so you can say, yeah, that's an awesome gun. <laughs> um, and he wrote books. That's, that's basically what Monster Hunter was. Um, and they were well written. And they had lots of guns. <laughs> and then he went on all these listers and said, hey guys, I wrote this book for you. To the Bolton Boards. Hey guys, you've known me for years. I'm not just some guy who's spamming the board with his, his new thing, thing to show. I've been a participant, you all know me. I've written this book for you guys. I think you should look at it. And he leveraged his platform in a wonderful way, knew his market, targeted his market, knew how to market it to them, and sold a ton of books. Then he, when he got a chance for a New York publishing deal, he took it and he explains why um, on Ryan Excuses. Um, but, the platform was extremely helpful for him. Another person who did a very good job of this was Christopher Paolini. His platform was, I'm 15 and I wrote this book, um, which he did. Um, his family then self-published it. And um, contrary to rumors, they didn't own a publishing company. A lot of people think that. What they did is they started a company, um, which a lot of self-published people do. Um, even a lot of, you know, I started a company for my books to, to then hold the, the copyrights and things. And they started a company and they, they did the school of zip route, which is very successful, though a little bit oversaturated, well, a lot oversaturated in um, children's right now, YA, um, and middle grade in particular. That is where he would go to a new city, he would do assemblies in a bunch of different uh, schools during the day, and then sell the books there. And he did hundreds of those and started a grassroots campaign with his platform being, I'm your age, you could do this too, let's talk about how we write and let me give you a cool assembly on being a writer as a team. Uh, had, he had a great presentation, people really latched onto it, they started reading his books, they liked his books, they were written for kids, by kids, sort of thing, um, and he took off. Um, but if you talk to Christopher, it's that platform that really got him that extra distance. And in self-publishing, a lot of these success stories come out of the platform. Whether the platform is Joe Conrad's, um, I was a pro who now has gone indie, and let me talk about the indie process. He's very much an expert on it. He has a big blog where he published a post very frequently on topics related to this, and his platform is indie publishing is awesome and you should try it. Um, and he has leveraged that into an enormous platform. Um, he also happens to be a very good writer for, uh, for, you know, good writer of the types of books he is promoting. And he took off before he had that platform. 
um, I, I think. But he certainly has leveraged it very well. So if you are going to self-publish, you have to market a lot. Now, it's, um, <coughs> it's said in publishing these days that you have to market a lot no matter what. And that is true. However, as a self-published writer, um, the big thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to find a way to draw attention to yourself and to your novel. And most people are doing this by having a very interesting blog that is written about some topic that relates to their books but is not about their books. If pe people are not going to keep reading if, you're, um, if your blog is just a big marketing thing for your books. Now that's basically kind of what my blog is because my blog is not there to generate um, people reading my books. Um, my blog is there for fans of my books to come and get extra information. So my, mine is like, you know, that, that, that's a very different thing from the I am going to write a really cool blog and draw attention to myself and then sell my book as a side product of in, people coming to my blog and being interested by it. And that is, um, that is all about marketing. I don't think any of this has changed from 20 years ago. Um, what has changed is that it is now easier. And I do think your chances of being able to make it have gone up many times. Um, even before, because of the huge investment of capital you had to do uh, to, to publish a book, even if you had a lot of this stuff, it was really rough going. Now it's still rough going, but the really is kind of dropped out, and it is a viable alternative to publishing in New York. Um, quite viable. If you're willing to do this stuff, um, I would send anyone who is excited by doing everything, which again we're just going to talk about in a minute, who, um, who recognizes your biggest challenges and has got a platform in mind and um, is willing to market, then this is a good choice for you. If that is not what you want to do, then I would suggest still researching and learning about these things, but the hype is going to ignore that this is a bad match for you if these things are things that make you wince, okay? Um, so, what are the things that you would do yourself if you want to self-publish the right way? Well, number one, a good cover is still important. Despite the fact that it's digital cyberspace, um, you do need a cover. I disagree with those who suggest the best way to get a cover is go to stock art and build it in 30 minutes. They do that. They do that a lot. Um, in fact, Dean does this. This is how we, he, um, he does his stories. Is he, um, he goes and gets stock art. You can buy the license for like 25 bucks um, or less, and then slap a cover, um, cover together and put it out. Um, I think that if you want to do this the right way, you will get a good cover, and you will have someone, either you pay them or someone you know, to do good cover design. The cover design is all the borders and the way the lettering is done and things like this on the cover. You can tell a self-published book so easily. And if your book does not look like one of them, then you are already leaps and bounds ahead of them when people come to your page. So a good cover, which is more than just the art, um, a good cover costs money. I do not advocate trying to find a way to get a cover really cheaply in kind of a, um, a, an unfair way. Um, now, there are ways to get covers cheaply in a fair way. One of these would be to go to DeviantArt, look for covers that would match yours, contact the author and, or the artist and say, hey, I want a non-exclusive license um, to put on the cover of my ebook fantasy. What would you charge for that? You might be able to get it for, you know, I would say a fair price for a cover. You're still looking at several hundred dollars. Um, you know, uh, uh, the ones I've heard of that, that, are, that are okay but not fantastic, we're looking at 250 bucks. So what, the minimum you should be willing to pay. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. I have a mm -hmm. novelette that I finished yeah. that I asked a friend to write. He's only charging me 70 and uh -huh. a, copy of, a copy of it when it's finally printed. There you go. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, but uh, DeviantArt would be a good place to start for friends who do art. The thing about it is um, make sure it's of a professional quality. Okay? It's worth the extra money to get a professional quality cover. Don't fall into the trap of just putting anything on your cover. 
all right? And you can do a, a cool professional looking cover that is more design work that's going to be cheaper. Does someone have like an iPad or something, look up the cover of Infinity Blade, um, the book I did. Um, you can do something like this or, the, uh, or the, the Wheel of Time covers in the UK. You can do something that's more symbolic if you've got a good designer to make the cover look really professional that doesn't require paying $5,000 to a cover artist. Now, I know kind of if you're hiring a graphic designer, yeah. it'll be like 50 or $60 an hour for freelance work. Right. And they should be able to do something like this in five or six hours, I would guess. Um, um, so someone got that for me. Okay, yeah, hold, stand up and um, hold that around. So this sort of thing, you a good designer could put together fairly inexpensively, um, not using, um, not having to have a high, um, a high paid illustrator. Um, it's a sword sitting on some rock. Um, but that is much harder to do than you're thinking it is. You need a professional designer, you may be one, but you need a professional designer to do this. Make something that looks really quality and um, your, your sales will follow. Number two, pay for editing. Pay for at least copy editing, okay? <laughs> Proofread. This again is gonna cost you a couple hundred bucks. Don't just have your friends do it, though having your friends read is good. You want a professional copy editor to look at the book and get all the typos and, and things out of it. Uh, number three, this one you might be able to do yourself. You used to not, in fact you should be able to do this yourself pretty easily. You used to not be able to, but um, all the e-readers, uh, reflow, is that what they call it? Um, they, the pages, have, the checks has to be able to change sizes and um, it has to be able to, to, to Am I right on that? Reflow? Pages are not constant. Yeah, the pages aren't constant. If you change the text size to, to 12, it's gonna, the page numbers are going to change around. Everything's going to change around. And so you don't, ever, you don't have to worry about a lot of things that typesetters used to worry about, which is making the lines not spacey, which means that there's not like weird spaces on the page. And there's not orphans, which are like words that are like one word from a paragraph on a page. I can't remember if that's an orphan or a widow, but <laughs> widows and orphans, things like that. You don't have to worry about any of that anymore because the um, e-readers all refer the flow of the text. So you just have to get some basic layout stuff. And four, you have to be able to upload it, which uh, most of the websites are making pretty easy to do. So, I would be looking, if you were going to self-publish a novel, at still spending 500 bucks minimum to do this. That puts you in the hole. Um, and that probably, that goes against what some of the people are saying to do with this, but that was, is what I would say. Um, which is why having then this marketing and, the, uh, and all of these sorts of things is still really essential um, to, to doing a good job of it. And so the answer to you, who asked the question? It's back there. The answer to you, whoever asked me the question, don't you still want to do this stuff? Is yes, you still want to do this stuff. Um, the more corners you cut here, the more you're going to look like a self-published author. And self-published is probably the wrong term for that nowadays. The more you're going to look like an amateur. Um, because there are pros that are um, self-publishing now. But, and you don't want to look like an amateur. You meant you hinted that there was more that you would you might want to do with editing. What other kinds of editing would you contract, you, and how would you find those people and know that you're not going to spam? Yeah, good question. You could also do full board um, content editing. Um, how would you find those people? I would look for someone who's been a professional in the industry, um, who is now gone um, to part time and is doing editing on their own. Uh, Stacy used to do this, and she was a good choice. I think Dave still does this um, for some people who approach him. Um, there are authors and editors out there who have a good track record, look for references, look for people who have worked in the, um, in the field, in the industry, and find out what they charge. They will probably charge a per page, assuming a page is whatever, you know, 250 words, a per page um, cost to do this. And it can be pricey. So like, anywhere from, what, what would be a range for a book of um, I've, I've never done, what's that? Of, um, I've never done this. I'm trying to find a number. It's one of those things that slipped out of my mind. Um, I think that you, you, you'd be expecting like a 500 buck minimum and going up from there for, for editing. 
you know, I, I think uh, pro editors like um, like Moshe um, get paid somewhere around five grand a book, uh, um, plus bonuses and things for how the book does. Granted, they're doing a lot more. They're not just doing the content editing and the line editing. They're doing cover, um, working with the cover artists and all that stuff. But yeah. Also. What would you do for your title? Like most of the publishers oh, yeah. are going to pick your title. Wouldn't you want to? How would you make sure that your title is a marketable? Title? No, that's a good question. Um, because I think, don't think a lot of, uh, of, of amateurs. I'm going to stop using that term, self-published. But I do think. Actually, I'll say that a lot of self-published writers don't take as much effort the, um, for their titles. They should. Um, in New York, titles are felt that are shorter are generally felt to be better, um, and. Something, I mean, titles are such a hard thing to talk about. But one thing I noticed from a lot of amateur self published writers is that they have it be like this long string, you know, it's like the, the kingdom of this and this, book one, this and this, some, the, um, some person's quest. And it's like this huge mouthful where it just looks really awkward. Um, so short and sweet is probably better. <laughs> um, short and sweet is probably better. Um, yeah. Uh, do androids dream of electric sheep versus Blade Runner? There you go. Exact, exact, exact answer. Um, do androids dream of electric sheep? Um, actually, say quirky long titles like that were very much the rage for um, for short fiction and science fiction and fantasy during the um, the seventies and eighties. Uh, pretty good. I'm more like the 60s and 70s. So you, you get things like, I must scream, but I have no mouth, but I must scream. Um, and repent, Harlequin said the TikTok man. Um, I think that's it's even longer than that. I think that's only like abbreviation. You, you see things like that. You still see them occasionally, particularly in short fiction. You don't see those in novels. Remember, um, Your Android Dream of Electric Sheep was actually a novella. Um, and I think it may have been published separately, but it. Dick was a uh, short fiction writer, and he knew how to do good short fiction titles. And the thing about those titles is, those are titles that when you're looking, scanning through the front of, um, of a, a, a magazine that you've already bought, looking for which one to read and looks interesting, when you run across Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, where everything else would have like a simple Blade Runner style title, that one was like, whoa, that's weird, I'm going to read that. Um, does that make sense? Which is very different, actually, than the book marketing um, business. You would say, yes, that could do the same thing. If you have the right title, it can. Um, what are some that have done that? You, you see books that do that. A good, quirky title can work, but stay away from, what I'm getting at is stay away from like the colons, stay away from like the big, long colon things that have ding, and then colon, ding, and then you know all of this stuff in your title. Don't make it messy. If your title is something like Your Entry Stream of Electric Sheep, okay, you know, go for that. But um, I, I, would, I would even be worried about that one in today's market. I think the longest book title I've ever seen is The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland Using an Airship of Her Own Design. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That one's actually not bad. I don't mind that one. Uh, what's that? It, it, it's actually kind of, um, but um, there's a, yeah. I'm on, on video, so I don't want to mention any author, author specifically. But go look through Amazon, and you will see what I mean, I think. You'll see these big, long titles. Um, and often, they have covers that look like they were drawn um, by a, t a, a high school art student that shows some promise, but if you look closely at them, you're like, ooh, um, that sort of thing. So this is where you don't want to be. There's another hand over here somewhere. Oh, I was just thinking. Uh what you were describing kind of reminded me of what I thought of uh, the name of the wind. Okay. I mean, yeah, really good book, but the the title just stood out to me in the sort of in the way that you described. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. So um, this again, read those blogs I talked about. If you're really interested in this, there this is can be a good way to go. I do suggest a few things for it. Um, if you are a slow writer, this is generally going to be bad for you. Not always. You kind of have two main archetypes for this, and one is book is released, and then marketing! You know, you just go on a blitz 
you make your platform and you have your book and you price your book fairly high for, um, for a self-published ebook and you just market and market and market and market. Um, the other model is you write a ton of stuff and you don't focus on that one book. You still have your platform and things, but you just write as much as you can and release as much as you can and you price a lot of it at the 99 cent price point knowing that you're going to get a much smaller royalty um, trying to get as many people to read your books as possible to get a following whereupon you price, price later books in a series more expensively. This is what Amanda Hawking did. Um, her early books were 99 cents or even free and the later books were 299 and she just wrote a lot of them. Joe Conrad does this as well and um, it has a steady stream of books coming out. A lot can really just mean three or four a year which, you know, that's still a lot, but remember these are probably 80,000 word books, a lot of them. Um, so you're writing shorter books, and you are putting them out there and pricing the early ones cheap, and then using your platform to try and get people hooked. Or you're writing very infrequently, and this is really hard in the self-published world. This is much better for the traditional publishing method, because it, it takes you two years to write a book, it's going to be really hard to spend the time you need marketing and, and whatnot to make things take off as a self-published writer, whereas you're better off probably try shooting for that publisher. I still think everybody's still better off shooting for that publisher um, because of what they do for you. Let's, let's give the, um, the counter argument now. We've talked a lot about this. Um, this is very viable. Don't let me tell you that don't, you know, don't let what I'm going to say next scare you off of this if you're interested in it because it is but it is a lot of work. Um, I'm granted an extraordinary case, um, but Tor spent six, fi six figures marketing Alloy of Law, okay? Um, a lot of that money, you know, the 70% the that you're not seeing, the publisher is paying to a lot of people to do a lot of things for your books, even when you're a new writer. And so having a legal department, for example, Having um, an actual cover designer um, who hires cover illustrators to do a great illustration, and they will spend on a new, even a new author, they'll spend five grand on a cover, easy. Um, for for a lot of uh, more popular authors, they're spending twenty grand on a cover. If you count the time of the um, of, of all the design work and things like this, um, they will give you an advance up front to live on while you write your next book and they will sign an editor to you whose job is partially to keep you going and writing um, and is used to dealing with the writers. Um, they can get what we call co-op space. Co-op space is a great hidden thing that a lot of self-published authors don't know about and that is every book that is on the front page of Amazon anywhere or that goes out, you know, if you belong to Amazon, you get emails that say, hey, this person's new book came out, I know you bought these. The publisher pays for them to send those. You don't get in those unless you pay. That's what's called co-op. If you walk into Barnes & Noble, all the books at the front of the bookstore got there because the publisher paid to get them there. Almost all the books on the end caps got there because the publisher paid them to get there. There are a few places where the um, bookstore can put up, like a, the, this is a favorite of the bookstore type thing, so you, those don't necessarily get paid for, those are legit. It's not like even the staff recommends, those aren't paid for, but it, everything that's got a sticker on it that says any sort of thing, 20% off this week, the publisher paid to get that sticker on it and put there. Um, on Amazon, anything on any page that publicizes it, um, except maybe the People who bought this also bought this. I don't think that one's co-op, but everything else I believe is co-op. Um, the, the email marketing, all of this stuff um, is paid for by the publisher. Because it's that shelf space based thing. To sell books, you have to get books in front of people's eyes. Co it's called co-op because um, a lot of times it's not actually paying. Sometimes it is. I think the email blasts are actually just paid for. Um, I could be wrong on any part of this, by the way, <laughs> any of the specifics because I don't do this, so I, but, um, but I'm pretty sure those emails, in fact, I, I've been told those emails are by my publisher. So, um, but it's called co-op, because a lot of times what they're doing is they say, okay, we will put the book in the front of Barnes & Noble for you, Barnes & Noble says, but if it sells, you have to give us an extra dollar. It's co-op because if the book sells, they get an extra dollar, not we're paying you money up front. 
though some of the things are we're paying you money up front, but a lot of them are, are cooperative marketing like that. Um, and Barnes and Noble only has a certain amount of space up there. They don't want books up there that won't sell then because they get part of their money off of the book selling. It gives them an incentive to make sure it actually gets up there rather than gets forgotten in the stock room and things. But so they don't offer that space to books that the publishers can't convince them will sell a lot of copies. And so the self-published authors don't get that space because um, unless they have a proven track record, the publisher can come in and say, hey, we're spending a hundred grand marketing this book. It'll sell. Give us the co-op space. They'll be like, all right, you can have you know three weeks of co-op at this um, at this price. The self-published person comes in and says, hey, I'd like to buy co-op space. Sure, I'll give you an extra dollar out of every, every book I sell. And they'll be like, ha, um, you're not going to sell any, so we're not giving it to you. So this is a great hidden thing that is very that is um, is still a barrier to entry. Um, self-publishing is democratizing things. Word of mouth is still by far the best way to sell books. Uh, and but the second best way is to have the book in front of people's eyes so that they can impulse buy it. And almost all of that is controlled by co-op, even still. Despite how much this, the um, e-book readers like to say, tell publisher us and skip the middleman, they're still giving all the co-op space to the middleman because the middleman can, can generate a lot of those sales. Um, so, questions about self-publishing. Um, if you're doing ebooks, don't you lose out on chances to like, get into the smaller bookstores a lot? You do. However, you can also do a two-pronged attack um, by selling the ebook, seeing how well it does, using some of that money if you actually do sell well, to then uh, approach independent booksellers in your area and get it shelved. And if you're really something, even get it national. That's hard to do, but you can. Well, I know some smaller bookstores are now starting to sell ebooks too. Like I know the yes, English bookstore is starting. Yeah, Mark. How about getting reviews? Uh, all but impossible. Um, Kirkus, and, and it might be Kirkus. Kirkus, I think, started up one where you could pay to have them review for you, but then put on it like Kirkus Discoveries or something like that as a Kirkus is we paid to get this review. Uh, all but impossible, but on the flip side, the reviews are basically not important. Reviews are what the booksellers will pay attention to to know if they want to stock the book. Uh, the reviews are what librarians will pay uh, attention to whether to put it in libraries. But if you don't have a physical product, the review is not going to be that important. How many people here read Publishers Weekly and ever have? Okay, we do have one Publishers Weekly, uh, oh, two of you. Um, but most people are not. Um, New York Review of Book Reviews. New York Times book reviews, a lot more people read, but science fiction fantasy doesn't get reviewed there anywhere. Anyway. So, anyway, reviews should not be a major concern to you unless you write YA books and you're trying to get into the, the particularly the school libraries. Uh, now, cover quotes are something else. The public pays better attention to cover quotes than they do to reviews. Um, you're not going to get good reviews as a science fiction fantasy writer really anyway. Um, I mean, you can look and see what like, the best people. Uh, George Martin gets good ones. Neil Gaiman gets good ones. Uh, but most of us don't even get any attention um, from them. And like, when the Washington Post mentioned me in a, and Brandon's got an interesting magic system, in an article that wasn't about me, it was just about something, Tor plastered that all over my books because they're so excited. I'm like, this is a lame review. It's like, that's kind of interesting. And they're like, it's kind of interesting, Washington Post. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Um, but, but to them, that's, that's like a really big deal. Robert Jordan once got an article in the New York Times, and they, that, that review has become like the glowing pinnacle of what Tor has achieved, having this great review in the New York Times. Um, it's just so hard to get genre fiction to get any attention. Uh, children's has a lot of the same. Why do they hate us like that? <laughs> you know, they don't like to read it. So, and there, the people who read the, those newspapers don't like to read what we write either. So, they're writing reviews to their, to their market and books that their market might be interested in, and we're not something that their market reads. So there's really no, it's not a, it's not something to be bitter about. I mean, when Locust didn't review me, I was a little bit annoyed. Um, <laughs> Locust didn't review The Way of Kings. Um, but when the New York Times doesn't review you, I mean, New York Times readers don't read our books by their demographic. Sure, some of them do, but you know, it's not a good demographic choice. 
What about sending a copy to the buyers for, like the local buyers for Barnes and Noble and stuff like that? There are no local buyers. Everything happens in New York mm. for the chains. There is virtually no chance of getting into Barnes and Noble except on a case by case basis where you go into the bookstore and ask them if they'll shelve your book. Once in a while you get lucky and they will. Because the manager can shelve a book, um, but you have to go to each bookstore individually and see if they will. And then if they sell out, they contact you or do you have to keep checking it? You keep checking it. Um, and usually they're going to say no. There's so many people coming in wanting the book shelved. Um, they, what they'll probably say is, you can have a signing and we'll sell them on consignment, which means that you'll get like 10%, um, which usually for a self-published writer means losing money. Um, because the, yeah, but, but it, that can happen. The local book community is actually pretty friendly to self-published writers, uh, but you should view all of these things as publicity, not as money making, if you're self-publishing. And chances are, they're only gonna shelf your book if it like appeals to a local market. Like yeah. here, if, if, if it was LDS fiction, they might shelf it. Yeah. Or if you're like in Did Montana. Did you work in a bookstore? No, but in Montana or something, they, if it was like outdoorsy stuff, then they yeah. would shelf it. I mean, you do see some getting shelved. Uh, the Crystal Moon dude, I think, gets some bookstore pre store presence. He's worked really hard. You can Google the Crystal Moon guy. He's interesting. He's always at the, um, he's always at Costco. Mm -hmm. If you've seen a dude selling um, his fantasy, um, did some of you guys seen him? Crystal Moon dude at Costco. He's like always at Costco. I uh, know. He's like cloning himself. There's like six of him. <laughs> <laughs> and he's an interesting guy. Um, but you are better off when you're self-publishing, trying to see if you can get attention online, or if you've got a physical product. Bookstore visits, they're so hypersaturated now because Shadow Mountain got into it. Shadow Mountain, de, de, which is the, um, the church's um, fantasy Why? imprint. It's not really a fantasy imprint, but it's their national imprint, but they do a lot of fantasy. Uh, Brandon Mull um, and Uber, Obert Sky. He was the Baptist or Barbecue guy. I don't remember what his real name is. Um, all those guys, it was Levin Thumps that he did. All those, they figured out what Christopher Paolini was doing and they started doing it hardcore gung-ho, and now if you go to the schools, they're like, yeah, yeah, we have 50 people asking to do this. We don't want you to come shill your book in our books in our school, go away. Um, some of them still like it, but it, it's become a much harder thing to do because everyone jumped on the bandwagon. Used to be that you would get paid to do a school visit, and a lot of authors made their money going to do school visits, and they would do these very big in-depth presentations where they go to different classrooms and stuff, now school visit means big assembly where Shadow Mountain shoots t-shirts at people um, <laughs> and throws a big party. Um, and it, these guys are really good at it. Mull has um, got a great school visit presentation. Um, it was really a smart move on their part, but it's free and it's, it's changed the market dra dramatically. So anyway, uh, they, did, they did a very good job with it, but they did really saturate it, like I said. Um, Mark, it sounds like you're uh, really considering the self-publishing thing. Oh, uh, no, I don't, well, I hope, I hope I don't have to. Um, but anyway, it um, comes down to, um, comes down to that whole platform thing. It's really going to help you self-publishing. Um, go look at what Dean Wesley Smith and Joe Conrath are saying. What Dean's method is, is he writes a ton of short stories, puts them in collections so he can sell them at $2.99 for five stories, um, does a cover in 30 minutes, puts it on there and tries to have like hundreds of these on there with each of them selling like a hundred copies a year. That's his, that's his method. And he, if he can do this, um, that, that's what, that, yeah, anyway, that's the, how he's approaching it. Um, I don't know what I think of that method, <coughs> uh, but you can read about it yourself. Yeah. From a, a reader's perspective, yeah, I, I I haven't read any ebooks, but uh, somebody at LTUE had a unfavorable opinion of ebooks in general. Okay. And I think it was a she, but in any case, uh, they uh, I can't remember who it was, but a fifty fifty chance. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, a slightly better chance technically. It is a she. Uh, in any case, she uh, said that. Um, without the filter of a publishing company or, and the editor, that there's a lot of amateur, low quality books? There are, there are a ton. That, however, shouldn't, 
not, it is saturated with low, low quality stuff. However, that's like saying, you know, that, again, it, it, most of the fish that you're going to see are inedible. Yes, they are, but they're still good ones. And it's the same thing with self-publishing. You've got an uphill battle, um, but it is not necessarily, it, it's not a good idea to correlate the fact that a lot of amateurs are self-publishing, therefore only amateurs self-publish. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a logical fallacy. Um, there are some good people doing good work in the self-publishing field, but the issue is, if you would go to a, a, a New York publisher, they are filtering out most of that stuff. They are still going to publish some stuff you're going to think is just like terribly low quality. Most of it's not seeing, hitting the bookshelves. I would say that the self-publishing world probably has um, a similar level of quality in a lot of its books, except all the stuff that normally would be ejected is also getting published. And so it creates a really, really big field full of, yeah, yeah. Are there things you can do as a self-publisher that make you either more or less attractive to a New York publisher? industry publisher? Yeah. Um, right now, if you, basically a lot of the stigma is gone. If you sell a certain number of copies, that's all they care about. It used to be if you could sell 2,000 copies in print, then they paid attention. Um, I would say now, the, the big thing is, a, a lot of self-publishing people are being like, number one, Amazon bestseller, which they're really not. They put their book at free, and they hit number one in you know, fiction, mystery and suspense, books about boat houses, um, <laughs> number one, for like an hour. Because they had, a, they had a marketing blitz where like five of their friends bought it. <laughs> um, and that's, um, you want to stay away from saying your book like this, but if you were to write a publisher and say, I priced my book at $2.99 and I sold 10,000 copies in three months, they would pay attention. I guarantee it. Um, your sales rank has to back that up on Amazon, but they would pay attention if you were doing that. It's, it's all going to come down to numbers with that. <clears throat> and it could be a lot of people think the way it's going to go. You're next. I'll get you. Um, the way the people, a lot of people think the way it's going to go is that um, it's going to go that way. The publishers will start looking for the people who are successful there. They will come and offer them advances in marketing budgets and a, a skilled team in exchange for part of their royalty. Um, and the fact that Amanda Hawking went with a, a New York publisher despite making millions as a self-publisher is still pretty telling. Um, but Joe Conrath would never go back, um, and he's he's making six figures pretty pretty handily with his writing. So there are arguments on all sides, but it is flooded with a lot of subpar material. Um, so that's it, it, it's losing its stigma as something you know, but it's still gaining a stigma of wow, uh, there's just a lot of crap in there. How how do I know yours isn't? But again, in entertainment, you basically have that uphill battle anyway. A lot of people say, oh, I'll, I read some that fantasy stuff. It was all terrible. Why, why is yours going to be any better? Um, I was just going to ask, are there certain markets that are like that have a higher percentage of readers that have like ebook readers? Yes, it's a good question. I should have mentioned that. Um, generally, selling the best right now tend to be the short, quick thriller style books or the short, quick romance style books. And you can put those in any genre. Um, Amanda Hawking was, uh, was, was quick urban fantasy teen romance, I believe. Uh, Joe Conrath is, is, is the quick thrillers. I could be wrong on that. How many words are those? Um, I haven't actually bought one to count the words. But looking, I tried to look and guess based on kilobytes, and they looked like they were about 80,000 was kind of the sweet spot. They may be a little shorter. Um, you, could add, you could email Joe and ask him. Um, or you could, you know, um, get one of his books or something like that. I don't know how, but it seems like the short, quick books are really selling much better. And romance is really dominating with thrillers second behind. Um, I haven't seen <coughs> epic fantasy doing very well, but that's probably because of this problem. Epic fantasies take so long to write. Um, you can't, it's hard to generate a lot of buzz. There are some people who are trying. Uh, Moses Sigridar, um is, is a nice guy I've met several times, and he's trying really hard to do it with epic fantasy. Um, I don't know what level of success he has had yet, um, but um, but yeah, I yeah. I think he said he broke two thousand. Two thousand, two thousand sales. Yeah. That's good. That's really solid. Um, he's pricing his at ninety nine cents, isn't he? 
Yeah. He dumped, he dropped it down. Yeah. Um, and so um, so that's that's actually pretty solid. But you can see in Epic Fantasy we haven't yet had a big breakout. I don't believe in the self-published world. Um, you know, I, I sold fifty thousand of the uh, so far of the of the Infinity Blade book, which was which was ebook only. But I also had um, Epic Games, you know, Unreal Engine, doing the marketing on that. So that's not really self-published. Um, I haven't done one where I'm completely self-published yet. So I, I want to try a novella and see see what I can um, see where it goes, so I can have some better uh, numbers. Would, would you do that for Alcatraz Five? Um, uh, no, Tor wants Alcatraz Five. So. Ooh. So I, I will probably um, do a bookstore release of Doctor Five. Plus, I don't think the middle grade kids are reading ebooks. Uh, Teens yeah. are, mm -hmm. um, but the, but the middle grade kids aren't. So middle grade would be a bad market right now for for doing ebook self published. Teens are fine. Older teens in particular. Older teen romances, yes. Okay. All right. We are going to have to go to writing groups. So. Um, someone write down um, back there, uh, contracts and getting a good agent, because we'll still we'll do that on our next business one. We'll come back next week and do uh, do more uh, writing um, style stuff, and then we'll do another business the week after, so we keep mixing it up.